Right. Afternoon, everyone. The clock on the wall is slightly slow, but we might have as well start. Welcome back to OUC, a bit confusing last week. We're over in physics again and very pleased that so many people could join us for supplier's perspective. We had Greg Jackson talking from Octopus Energy mm -hmm. and looking from where they sit, controllable load, everything's very happy. So isn't that great? We've just got a few systems problems to deal with. <laughs> so maybe we can cover those off in the next 10 minutes and we'll be finished. Anyway, back to today. And as I say, linked to some of those things from last week, we're very pleased to welcome Paul Wakeley from NG ESO shortly, shortly next month to become the national energy system operator. So suddenly it's not just electricity, it's that other thing called energy that people forget includes other vectors, primarily gas. I guess it doesn't cover petrol, for example, does it? No, so, uh, no but probably hydrogen. Not. Yes, I knew someone had to say that word in this room. Anyway, Sorry. so hopefully <laughs> you're going to take us behind the scenes in the development of a national blueprint for decarbonising the GB energy system by 2030. And I love the fact that we say GB because lots of people talk about the UK, but they do not mean Northern Ireland. I mean, Great Britain energy system. Um, so it was published in March, yes. ambitious programme spending nearly £60 billion. And also in my mind, it's interesting comparing that with what you might need to spend in the water industry and the difficulty in raising the kind of capital needed in that space. So I think we're in a very different situation with that. Um, I understand you're head of strategic network development. Good. Sometimes it, oh, it's been updated. Not no, no, Anyway. No, 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 no. Very good. Uh, and you came from a consulting background and started very briefly. Yeah. 12 years ago in National Grid, as it yeah, was yeah. at that time. Um, and you were working on network code development. Know, so, yeah, yeah, but you know, you start, you've got to start somewhere, yeah. haven't you? Um, so I understand your team is accountable for future development of the GB transmission system. Yeah. Uh, which, of course, wasn't designed by engineers originally. They just sort of hooked things up to see what would happen. And, you know, by magic, there's an interconnected network. So you got a background initially in PPE. Uh, so I got, well, so I have a degree in PPE and a PhD in math. But then applied mathematics. Yeah. I was going to come to that I bit. Did, I was I just going to build it. Uh, but the other way around, you see, that's what we've been using. Yeah. And we're grateful for you taking time to come today. I don't know if we pulled you away from scouting duties or the school <laughs> governor chair role, which is, yes, exactly. Anyway, over to Paul, and we really look forward to hearing what you have to say. Super, Paul. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, folks. Um, thank you very much for the invite. Uh, really great to be here in Oxford this afternoon. Um, I was trying to count on my way down. I think the last time I presented at a seminar in Oxford was some... 14 or 15, probably 16 years ago now in, I think, what was then the Mathematics Institute that's now flat. So, um, new building. New oh, yes, yes. <laughs> uh, so I did my, my PhD in applied maths at the University of Birmingham, but did some collaboration with some of the folks that were here. Um, so what do I plan to talk about next hour? So, so three big topics, uh, some of which are bigger than others, and we can flex and change these things as we go through as the as you you would like to, to dive into really so three big tickets so one who is the ESO what do we do and where are we becoming as we've already trailed as we become the NISO national energy system operator which hasn't quite landed in my head yet um, the much trailed beyond 2030 so our national blueprint for the decarbonized electricity system out to around the mid 2030s and absolutely right this is a plan for great britain so not not northern ireland uh, we are not accountable for the energy system on the island of ireland although i was there last week and pleased to report it was working very efficiently um and then the third one is really how did we get to the stuff that's in two so it delves into a bit more detail around the process that we go through and how some of those process steps are changing um, so I guess some apologies up front. Um, we speak in three letter acronyms or four letter acronyms in the industry. I will do my best not to do that. Um, if I make some assumptions, just shout. I'm really happy for you just to interrupt me and say that doesn't make any sense. That's industry jargon. Can you help me understand that in the real world? Um, and when I'm talking about a plan, uh, as Robin said, I'm talking about the transmission network. So in England and Wales, that's 275 kV and 400 kV uh, and it's the same in Scotland but also includes 132 kV for reasons of 
historic uh, background. So we're planning that that very high voltage uh, strategic network of the future. So starting off with our role as the ESO. Interestingly, we seem to be ESO today and become NISO. We're going to a word rather than an ESO. Funky. So what do we do? Um, so we are and have been since 2019 a legally separate part of the National Grid Group. So we are fully owned by the National Grid Group, but operationally um, and structurally separate from everything else that happens in the rest of the business. So the, the stuff that builds and maintains the network, builds interconnectors, runs the businesses in the US, we have nothing to do with them on a day to day basis. But we ultimately report into their FTSE 100 company that changes uh, later this year. Our primary role is that of balancing the electricity system on a second by second basis to ensure that supply meets demand and that electricity is flowing from where it's generated to where it's needed. We have our national control centre. Uh, in Wokingham and a backup and a backup and a backup of a backup um, that are there 24 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, keeping that. And you can find lots of YouTube videos online of, of visits that people have done there. Um, I was going to say Crichton from Red Dwarf, but that's not the, I've forgotten the Robert Llewellyn uh, in Fully Charged. He's been there. Guy Martin's been to visit. There's all sorts of different things. If you've not had an art chance to look at what we do in there, do have a look. And we're uh, part of our mission is to transform, be as part of that transformation to a sustainable energy system of the future that's reliable and affordable. So we don't generate electricity, we don't sell electricity, we don't uh, own the wires over which the electricity moves, but we are the organisation that makes it all work. And we make it all work from where I'm sat in the long term strategic planning, thinking 20, 25 years out, all the way through to person sat in the control room on a desk right now that is saying something's fallen off the system, this is what I need to do and press the button. So we cover that full range and say from 25 plus years right down to this second. Uh, fortunately, my work pauses for Christmas and I get Christmas off. Those in the control room don't. They have to be there 24 hours a day, uh, seven days a week. Um, but we uh, later this year, dates to be confirmed, some be called the general election, which has got slightly in the way of things. Um, we will become fully independent of National Grid PLC. So essentially the transaction is National Grid PLC will sell us to the government. The government will be our single and only shareholder, but we will be operationally independent from government. We were established under the energy or will be established under the Energy Act 2023. It's called the Independent System Operator and Planner or ISOP in that document, but will be called National Energy System Operator as our day to day uh, working title. So it will still be regulated by Ofgem as we are today. Um, we'll be owned by the Secretary of State, but sort of functionally independent, operationally independent. We'll have our own board of directors um, and then there we are sat there as NISO. Importantly, the E now stands for energy. So we immediately pick up responsibilities uh, for planning, strategically planning the gas network, uh, the methane gas network, and may well pick up additional responsibilities in future for things like hydrogen, depending on how those things progress, but the framework is there. So in addition to all of the roles that we do today as the electricity system operator, yep. Yeah, of course. No, so it will be not for profit. Yeah. So we will, the, the regulator will set an amount of money that we're allowed to, we, we put a plan for the regulator, the regulator says this is how much money you can have, but the intention is to not make a profit. So we won't be incentivized as we are today to make a profit and that we can keep some of it. Yeah, so I think I, I, I but yeah, so in England and Wales, uh, National Grid Group essentially own the physical transmission network, 275 and 400 kV. In Scotland, in the south of Scotland, it's owned by Scottish Power. Uh, and in the north of Scotland, it's owned by Scottish and Southern SSE. Uh, so the way that it works at the moment is that, or the way it worked when it was all given to them, essentially they get money back from it from an asset for 40 years or 45 years in their price control, um, but they own that asset forever. It's not a, it's not like a railway franchise. You've got it for a period of time. It's a, 
they own that, that's on their regulated asset. They get, get then funded for it for a period of time. No, no. So that's still separate. Uh, there is talk of, right, we might touch on it later today, of bringing competition into that. So other people might be able to produce or provide bits of the transmission network. So that already happens offshore. So offshore, there are what are called offtos, offshore transmission owners. I remember to define that one. Um, they, uh, there's a dozen or so of those that own the radial links out to some of the wind farms. So yeah, the only bit that's being uh, nationalized, if you will, is the electricity system operator and then the new bits around that. So as the NISO, we pick up some additional roles. Um, the one that I'm involved in around strategic planning, providing this whole system view of the energy sector. So noting that sort of it's become more than electricity. In markets, we pick up an advisory role across all of markets. We have a new uh, improved responsibility to do with uh, resilience and ensuring we have an energy system that is resilient because a lot of the structures that are in place today are designed around a fossil fuel and coal and gas electricity system. And and um, and what does this mean in the future if we have um, challenges, which then links into security of supply. So essentially making sure the lights are on and if there is a problem, how they happen. We also gain I, 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 the civil servant who wrote this should get an award. <laughs> we, we gain um, the responsibility to offer advice to ministers of the crown. In, that's what it says in the uh, in the Energy Act. It's sort of rather unspecified as to the level and breadth and scale of that. Um, it narks the devolved administrations because it doesn't say ministers of crown officially means DESNES and central government, but that's <coughs> we see our role as being very much across all of GB. So I've touched on strategic planning and that's what we're going to talk about mostly today. Where we get to in the future, this is a little trail of where we're going. So to sort of cast your mind forward now is we will have a number of roles in central planning. Um, the first one is a spatial strategic energy plan. So this for the first time will say where should things like generation assets go in the country today? That's essentially a little bit of central government intervention and a lot of market decision and a little bit of Crown Estate leasing seabed. The idea is that there is a more central and coordinated idea as to where and how much new nuclear you might place or where the next generation of offshore wind might go. That's the spatial strategic energy plan. That's one of the things that's got caught up in the general election. I, I nearly got caught up in that as well. I had to plead with our external affairs to let me come today. <laughs> so, um, uh, so that's been held up. We were expecting a commission from DESNES, the department on that, that it's been held up. Centralised strategic network planning. So that's planning out what networks we need. And that's an evolution of the stuff that I'm here to talk about today. And then also on the right hand side here, we uh, pick up a new role in regional planning, which is down at a more granular level, potentially down into distribution networks um, around how those regions should develop, how they want to engage local communities, local um, administrations, moralities, local authorities and those types of things. But, so these things all together become part of our future remit for strategic energy planning. We'll use coordinated assumptions and data and everything underpinning all of that. But the thing I wanted to focus on uh, in bulk today now was the Beyond 2030 plan. So that's sort of what we are and what we're doing and, and where we're going. And we'll, we'll come back to some of the where we're going later. But Beyond 2030. So why, I guess, Beyond 2030? Why did we publish something this year that said what it's going to look like in 2030? The network's been evolving for years, hasn't it? Um, well, well, it has, and here's a sort of potted history, and I appreciate there's lots of words here, but I'll put the slides afterwards to, to do that. But sort of a, a potted history of our, our network is that it hasn't actually changed an awful lot uh, in the last 20, 25, or even more years. The backbone of the transmission network that we have today is the one that was built in the 1960s and 70s when the 400 kV network was overlaid on top of the 275 network. And that 275 network was overlaid on top of the 132 network from the 1930s. And that was the one that was 
accidentally or on purpose interconnected overnight ooh, to see what would happen uh, by some mavericks in some control rooms somewhere um, that made the national grid iron in the 30s. So what we have is an evolution of a, you needed a national system that came in the 30s from the 132 network. The 275, 400 kV network, 50s, 60s and 70s, we are still basically running that system today with, with not a huge degree of change. But what that system is being asked to do has fundamentally changed since the 1960s and 70s. The 1970s and 60s, this was a centrally planned network to connect primarily coal-fired generation located on the coal fields, in South Wales, in Scotland, in the East Midlands, to the rest of the country. So an integrated plan by the, the then Central Electricity Generating Board, CEGB, uh, to you know, power modern Britain. And now it is the last of those coal-fired power stations that are finally coming off the network um, very soon. That network absorbed the sort of dash for gas in the 80s and the connection of CCGTs, close cycle gas turbines. Um, and similarly, the addition of nuclear power throughout the 60s, 70s and 80s, obviously with Sizewell being the last one um, to connect and in bits of work that have been needed for those. But fundamentally, this is a system that, that was designed for coal fired power in the middle, then being distributed to the load centres, not, not too far away. The system that we now have and the system we increasingly expect to have has the power in a very different place. So the power is now increasingly generated on the periphery of the system from offshore wind and from wind in Scotland. And solar everywhere um, and decreasing amounts of gas and we'll, we'll touch on that. So it's fundamentally a different type of system. The other thing is the scale of what the electricity system is going to do or needs to do as we transition towards net zero um, is quite significant. So today, I almost hate this statistic because I'm an electricity person, but now I'm an energy person, right? The gas network, the methane gas network, moves around three times more energy than the electricity network. Some of that admittedly then gets turned into electricity, but to the sort of cross count, but an awful lot of heavy lifting of our national energy need and energy demand is done by gas for power generation, which is on is on the decline, but for heating and industrial processes. That energy, that use that people want to use that for needs to go somewhere else. And we expect a lot of it to transfer over to electrification. So you can produce electricity from renewable sources, low carbon sources, and decarbonize those industries. But the consequence of that is that you move a lot more of that demand that was historically moved around by the gas network onto the electricity network. Not all of it, because there's some efficiencies, there's some energy efficiency, there's some heat pumps that are better than gas boilers in terms of efficiency and all of those kind of things. Um, so you see overall demand can come down slightly, but as a share that moves over towards electricity. So if we built the first national grid in the 30s, the super grid in the in the uh, in the 60s and 70s, we are now building the next iteration of the national grid um, that will serve us for many years to come. So I should put those the other way around, actually. Do this, that's right. So we use um, and publish every year something called the Future Energy Scenarios or the FES. And these are some sort of highlights from that. You can download the FES, you can download the data book. Uh, if you want to dive into all of these things in your in your detail. So, for example, top left here, this is carbon emissions. We use four different scenarios. Uh, there are three of them that get you to net zero. They're the three you know, colours, are they? Orangey, green and blue. And, and then one which is called falling short, which doesn't reach net zero by 2050. So all of them show a decline in the carbon production of the uh, economy as a whole and the fez does an overall economic uh, overall assessment of the gb system we see demand reductions as i've just spoken about but we also see increasingly there's this bigger chunk of our energy that is produced from weather dependent sources so solar and wind and potentially tidal in the future 
and therefore you need a system that can respond to the fact that it isn't there isn't just a, a button that you can press in the control room as you can today to turn a gas fired power station up or down you need a system that is inherently more flexible I think you mentioned Greg Jackson and flexibility and domestic flexibility and you know the, the worst case scenario is that we all get electric cars and we all go home and charge them at five o'clock they all need to be charged sometime between five o'clock at night and seven o'clock the next morning they don't all need to be charged at five o'clock so we need some flexibility and flexibility in future demand both large-scale demand that can can flex around and aggregated smaller demand is a is a key part of our future plans and in, in embedded in the networks that we see here so i will oh, i should have done that that way <laughs> so Beyond 2030 isn't just a plan we've plucked out of the air today. It's something actually we've been doing for for some years. So since the uh, middle part of the last decade, so around 2015, 2016, we published something called the NOAA, the Network Options Assessment. And that was an annual cycle of investment signals to the transmission owners, so National Grids, Scottish Power, Scottish and Southern, to say what was needed in their area. Ultimately, Ofgem still holds the purse strings on what gets built, but we were providing this annual signal and saying, yes, there's a, you know, looking at the future, as we decarbonize and what were some of the old targets, 80% reduction by 2030 or 2050, you know, the, the targets have changed over time, but we would see the move towards a greener power system and that would drive the need for more network because fundamentally you still need to move that electricity from where it's generated to where it's needed. In uh, July 2022, yes, that's right. Um, we published something called the Pathway to 2030 or the Holistic Network Design, where for the first time we said, actually, there's a big chunk of offshore wind coming by 2030. So the government has an aspiration of 50 gigawatts by 2030. How does that all connect? How does that connect? How would you um, connect all that together? What does that mean for the rest of the system? Um, but one of my taglines is 2030 is not the end. There is plenty more uh, development in the system after 2030. And so by March this year that we spoke about a moment ago, we published the Beyond 2030 report, which looks to around mid 2030s and connects around 85 gigawatts of offshore wind in total, plus um, uh, other stuff onshore. That is designed to get us to a power system that could roughly run at zero carbon so there should be a that's that's the that's the target that's the sixth carbon budget target uh it also gets called just because we like acronyms and we've now got five letter ones because four wasn't enough tcsnp so transitional centralized strategic network plan so we cast your mind back a few slides ago the one with three columns on it said in future we'll be doing something called the centralized strategic network plan at the moment we're doing something in that transition or the trans tra transitional centralized strategic network plan oh, who comes up with these things? And for, so the trouble is they get written down and then they stick. You can't get rid of that. I've tried to change it, but it just sticks. So that that's where we are headed. So, so this is just one of the sort of highlights from the future energy scenarios of what we expect the energy mix to look different between say, 2023 and 2030. Now, this is really a quite a short time period in <laughs> development of networks and development of, of our energy systems. So you see storage jumps up massively. So this is the, the 10 gigawatt line. So storage goes from less than 10 gigawatts to something approaching 30. Offshore wind, you'll see there approaching the 50 gigawatt target. Solar, primarily rooftop solar, but also some larger sort of solar farms jumping up massively. Fossil fuels does the opposite. So that's in in decline as, as gas fired power stations close, as coal fired power stations come off the system. Nuclear, probably, who knows? Um, <laughs> occasionally seem good at extending the life of a power state, nuclear power station. So, I, I, mean, I think this is designed to say at the moment, the sort of current plan is that a, cis, a station or two will have come off by 2030, but that Hinkley Point C won't be on yet. That's what that's designed to say. Uh, and then an increase in interconnection so that we can exchange power with our neighbours in, in Ireland and uh, in Europe. Not made easier by Brexit, but that is where we are. So 
what did we do? So I said first, the first thing we did in 2022 was publish the pathway to 2030 report. And uh, we, we, we trailed earlier 60, 60 billion. Well, I'm afraid 60 billion is half of the story. So it's actually two odd 60 billions together to get you to around 112 once you put things in different years and take out some double counting. But it's around 112 billion pounds worth of investment needed to get us to the mid 2030s. This was the first of that. So this was to connect that 30 gigawatts of offshore wind by 2030. Um, and as you'll see here, we've got a number of, of bootstraps, as you might call them, HVDC links down the down the, the east coast. Uh, there's a, a, a coordinated line from a wind farm off the coast of Isla. I recommend it very much as a holiday destination. I did all of the distilleries when I was there. <laughs> Your spot of theme in there, but that'd be my Scotland choice. Um, so it connecting into um, where's this near Kilmarnock, if I remember correctly, and then and then coming down into North Wales. Uh, you see coordination of these wind farms into sort of Lancashire, Cheshire area, North Wales. But the consequence of moving all of this wind is that you then need new lines in the north of Scotland, reinforcements of the existing lines. This is the Bewley to Denny circuit. This is the uh, ones up the east coast of Scotland in, in Aberdeenshire. Um, and consequently, if you're bringing more and more electricity further on north in the system, you then need to bring that south so you can bypass some of it. But finding landing points is, is not an easy thing to do. Coastal communities finding the right land that's both the right place right electrically is, is a challenge. So a lot of this lands around uh, Lincolnshire and the northeast uh, of England. You then need onshore reinforcements to make that happen. So this is a line called Grimsby to Warpole down through Lincolnshire. You'll see reinforcements in East Anglia driven by actually not the wind that was in an earlier leasing round uh, off the coast of East Anglia. But you'll see this sort of north to south push to move electricity. And this is because fundamentally the system, Scotland was designed to export a well, handful of gigawatts. In this world, it could be exporting 10. I mean, what we're about to see in a minute, it might be exporting 30. So it's fundamentally doing a very different job from the system it was designed to do. Or well, yes. you say reinforcing the network. Yes. The upgrading the existing pylons or having a few new lines of pylons that have got planning permission. Excellent. You also see I've managed to not delete the word Hitachi. Yes, I'll leave that there. <laughs> But I last used it. Uh, I checked it and I missed that one. Uh, so it's a combination of all of the above. So in part, it is reinforcing the existing network. So you can take existing 275 lines and turn them into 400 KV lines. So that gets you more bang for your buck than the existing route. You can replace conductors and uh, elements of the existing network to get a bit more power down them. But a large amount of this infrastructure is new build. So it is on it's the on this diagram the upgrades are the black ones and the new build are the purple ones that's terribly easy to see on this um, on this diagram uh, and then everything offshore is new so it, it is we, we will always look to upgrade the network first get more out of the existing routes because in general if a community already has a route they're usually more amenable to seeing that upgraded than saying to a new community here is a new route um, but again, the scale of the challenges is quite significant. So in our 2030 report, we said these are some of the sort of background. So 64% growth in demand. You know, this is this is the electricity system taking that heavy load from our energy system into the 2030s. 58 billion pounds worth of of network needed on on top of the 54 we already already saw. It provides a, a new network and a backbone across the system. It connects another 21 gigawatts of offshore wind off the coast of Scotland. So in total, connecting around 28 gigawatts of offshore wind in Scotland. We've done some analysis that suggests it has a cumulative benefit to the GB economy of around 15 billion pounds and can support 20,000 jobs. So what does that network then, then look like? So you'll see more off the east coast. So all of the yellow triangles, uh, yellow diamonds here are the additional offshore wind that have been connected in, in, in this study. We've also included the ones that connected in the previous study as the, the, the grey dots. 
Uh, they're not dots, are they? They're diamonds, that's what I mean. Um, and so what you can see here is essentially three more uh, significant routes or corridors are needed from north to south. So you need these additional lines off the east coast, providing around six gigawatts of additional capacity. So two of those lines then uh, come into Lincolnshire. One of them comes all the way down from a wind farm off the coast of Aberdeenshire and connects all the way into Kent. The challenge here being the primary demand centres for where we want the electricity, where we need the electricity, are in London, the South East um, and the Midlands. That sort of bypasses onshore. So you've got an offshore route, additional offshore routes off the East Coast. We've then said actually on the West Coast, so I spoke earlier about the one off the coast of Isla. Uh, we think there's something actually you can do with that design to get more out of that, to double that capacity. Um, to get you a further link down on the west coast into into North Wales, that helps bring power into into this region and, and around the uh, Merseyside um, and Greater Manchester and across into Yorkshire. But even once you put a new network offshore, off the east coast and the west coast, there is still a need to move power around. Uh, and actually, in this plan we are specifying or recommending a, a new onshore spine um, that runs from around Peterhead, I do it with a steady hand, down through Aberdeenshire, around the central belt, across southern Scotland, down through, that's uh, Cumbria, isn't it? Down through Cumbria into Lancashire, uh, and then connects into some upgrades around Merseyside. So essentially a network that is, is, is reinforced or or a new network. At the moment, north to south, we've got two onshore routes, plus one offshore route on the west coast, lots of offshore routes in the last plan and this plan, as you can see, they're, they're both on, on here. But even with that, we now say this is the time for a, an additional onshore network. And I think this is a, it's sort of pointing at the scale that this is not, Oh, there's just we've just built a new nuclear power station and it's in the wrong place. So this is a fundamentally different power system that's going to be doing something quite different um, in years to come. I should probably point out that 2035 isn't the end, but that's we'll come to that a bit later. Yeah. That's a good question. And I don't have that number off the top of my head. Yeah, so in general, offshore is more expensive. Um, and the, the challenge is that um, onshore, a, a double circuit, so a tower with um, circuits on both sides, sort of be a standard onshore circuit, will move around six gigawatts. Offshore, you would need three two gigawatt links to do that. So there's a sort of immediately there's a, a trade off there. Um, at the moment, HVDC is the equipment you need to go offshore long distances is, is expensive and supply chain limited for each pair of each converter station of which you need two for each link you're probably in the region of three four five hundred million pounds so a, an offshore point to point link like this you go well each one is 800 million for a pair of converter stations plus a chunk for a line of cable to move two gigawatts in, in yeah, that's the challenge. Right, I'm just asking yeah. a question about the West. So we heard yeah. from Regen about the fact that there's benefits from the system to have some more uh, Irish Sea deployed wind. Yeah. But none of these look as though you could bring substantial quantity of power. I'm sure. Is that because you've already got good enough connections, or you're not taking credibly the suggestion of Western deployment? Ah, so that's interesting. So the way that we at the moment don't decide where the wind is going to go. So there are, there are two organisations that decide where to lease seabed. It's the Crown Estate in England and the Crown Estate Scotland in Scotland. Um, they decide which bits of the seabed they're going to lease and when. So the results of what has been leased and what is to be leased in the next around a decade is a result of, of that. So at the moment, the Crown Estate haven't leased. There are lots of wind farms in this this part there was they tend to be quite small. Um, there are, are 
a set of there's some work ongoing at the moment around the Celtic Sea, so looking at four and a half gigawatts. I think if I remember correctly, yet yeah, that will either connect into South Wales or the Southwest, um, and then essentially it's for the Crown Estates to sort of have a view on where they want the next things batch to go. Um, and I think, um, but that also ties into the spatial strategic energy plan. Where is the right place to put the wind? And that's a, a non-trivial question because as I can see from your sort of energy system wheel, you know, all of these things that are interrelated and there's a view that there's lots of seabed, we'll just put it at sea. Actually, when the Crown Estate go, actually, here's a map of the sea, here's a map of all the people that want to use the sea, <laughs> and here's the map of the best bits for offshore wind, you actually run out of space quite quickly. Um, so there is a challenge in the marine environment between environment, energy, other uses and so on in the future. Yeah. Well, does the um, uh, Crown Estate also have responsibility for floating wind? So, so yes, so they would lease the same thing. And, and essentially the difference there is if it's shallow enough, you can fix it to the floor if it's not you're going to have to go for floating as yet have we got some demonstrating floating ones now yeah we have but they're up, they're up here aren't they um yes yeah. you imagine not much onshore wind so at the moment our scenarios are driven by uh essentially government policy as of today there is a you cannot build essentially build wind onshore south of uh, hadrian's wall you won't you won't get consenting for it uh, let's come back on the 5th of July. <laughs> it reminds you of that is going on in Wales because people are putting in planning permission for offshore wind. Yes. And it doesn't link very well into the grid. Furthermore, yeah, yeah. the closest places to connect to the grid are in England. Yeah. But that's not allowed, so they have to put much longer power lines through rural Wales. So. Yeah, so, so there's, I, I certainly know of a company that's essentially putting a line all the way across here, sort of Swan to the heart of Wales railway line roughly I think um yeah there was a connection project in mid Wales some years ago that never got off the ground uh, and I think this is where in the future something like a spatial energy plan that yeah. says actually Wales is a good place to put wind I'm hypothesizing it's close to the grid it's close to demand it needs some infrastructure but probably less than if you connected it up here in case ness for example but by the time that happens there'll be a hot project in my uh, uh almost certainly <laughs> Yeah, uh, most of this is point to point stuff. Do you see any role for multi purpose interconnectors over to Europe and Denmark and wherever? So, so, so there's, there's a couple of interesting things with multi purpose interconnectors, I think. So, so one, we need to work out how the framework would work, the regulatory framework, because um, at the moment, every country is an island, electricity, electric, you know, you, you connect to us and then we, we, we connect to the, the other party. So there's a whole issues to be connected as to who does the wind farm belong to, who has it rights, who does it have access to, and all of those kind of things. I think the other thing to think about with multipurpose interconnectors is if you've connected a wind farm in the middle of an interconnector, that can only then be used to import either wind or power from the other country. It can't do both. And there may be times when you wish it to do both. So have you you've reduced the number of connection points onshore in GB? Yeah. But actually, is there a time, is there a scenario where you need both that two gigawatts of offshore winds, for example, and two gigawatts from Germany, for example? I think that's something that we need to continue and to do. Resilience, you know, Mr. Putin is keeping an eye on everything he's put in, in the sea, I suppose. It, well, yeah, and I suppose that's the, <laughs> there is a lot of stuff in the sea here, right? And that is one of the advantages of onshore infrastructure, mm -hmm. is that in general, you can see it. It's pretty obvious. Um, that doesn't mean it isn't a target or couldn't be a target, but it is, if you can see it was um, Nord Stream, wasn't it? How it's easier to pop along, potentially. But the, the, other, the other thing here is that, of course, from a sort of operational point of view, you'll see that there's a big DC network now sort of overlaid on top of our existing AC network. And that will bring some, some significant operational challenges as to how we evolve, how we do system operation today in a world when it's, there is more. The electricity doesn't just flow according to the laws of physics, it flows according to how you've programmed certain boxes and power flows on some of these things. Yeah. Just to understand um, 
into set recommendation or study from the PSO gets sent to me. Yeah. How, like, what is the way in which a participant or option or a business says, okay, this is the kind that should be done? It's built second list. And they force the industry or a national grid transmission to build this, or how does this translate to yeah, the yeah. actual? Yeah, <laughs> a very good question. Uh, if I zoom towards uh, this slide. I brought too much, obviously. Um, so this is the kind of what happens next. Done our plan. Um, so we keep talking. So we we recommend a plan. We don't hold the purse strings. We don't say yes to planning. We don't we don't make the decision on whether it is or isn't the right thing. We've made a recommendation uh, based on a number of factors that says this is what we believe. Um, it then goes through a number of steps. So it is up to the transmission owners, so National Grid, Scottish Power, Scottish and Southern, to do the detailed design. So in that plan, they look like lines on a map, but they're, they're quite conceptual. It's a, they're gonna put a line from here to here. It needs a lot more detailed designs to whether it's going left or right of a village and those types of things. That's the responsibility of the transmission owner. And ultimately, Ofgem hold the purse strings. So Ofgem are the ones that decide whether something is funded. And if it's not funded, then the TOs aren't going to build it. <laughs> it's relatively straightforward. But there's a kind of second check, which is if it's not consented, if it's not given planning permission, you can't build it either. So you need the two things to align. You need planning permission and you need regulatory approval. So. We sit at the very front of this process and all of those things happen afterwards. The TO in doing its detailed designs needs to take that then through the regulatory process and the planning process. Now there is a there is a national planning process called the development consent order for doing large national infrastructure. Um, at least in England and Wales, it's different in Scotland. Um, but it needs to go through planning. Uh, but so those are the those are the two things. It is ultimately up to the TOs to decide what they build. But if they came back and said, that was a lovely plan, Paul, but I want to build this, then Ofgem would then come to me and say, why are they building something different? Can you justify why the thing's different or is there an improvement or that? So it's a, there's a little bit of sort of to and fro but but fundamentally we used to sit at the start of the process. Here's our recommendation that goes through as refined into detailed design needs regulator approval on this hand, planning approval on that hand, when those two things have happened, can then get built. How many years does this take? Ah, excellent question. So, um, any, uh, as, a, as a finger in the air is an average 14. 14. So from a, I think we need a line there to that line is on the bars and we can put megawatts down it, 14 years. That's too long uh, for a number of reasons. Um, one, because you can build a wind farm, especially onshore, a lot faster than that. And that is the situation we find ourselves in today. So particularly that growth in offshore wind in Scotland has happened faster than the network has been built. And that uh, explicit choice, that was a government choice called Connect and Manage said, right, yeah, we'll manage the constraints, we'll, we'll accept that it's there, but it's now sort of got a bit <laughs> out of kilter. Um, so there's a lot of work now needed, uh, a lot of investment needed to sort of catch up on that. The I'll jump to a different slide because it happens to be this. Uh, no, where am I going? Uh, this one. So last summer, was it? Yeah, so uh, Nick Windsor um, used to work for National Grid now move left us then about a decade ago now actually. Um, asked him as the electricity networks commissioner to say how would we speed up this process uh, ideally trying to get it from 14 to 7 which is more commensurate with how long it takes to sort of get a wind farm or, or something of that nature built um, recognizing the clear need and he he identified six big uh, big steps in that process. Um, 
so the need for strategic planning so that's that's this that's what we do it's what we might do in future in what we'll do in spatial energy planning trying to have a clearer view of where we're going and what it looks like um clearer design standards so it's a little bit more off the shelf rather than every time you design something bespoke change the regulatory approvals to sort of speed up that off-gen process remember i said it needs regulatory and planning so tidying that one up speed speed up the planning approval ah yes it's a lot in there isn't there so a a good chunk of time is spent in planning um it, the development the dca process is not fast the it is subject to judicial review it can be reviewed it can be challenged by local communities by by interested parties the scottish system has a sort of more automatic or lower threshold for sort of public inquiry um the challenges that planning is defined in primary legislation so in order to change that that needs an act it needs a government uh, act of parliament to change that the scale of what needs to happen uh, needs a lot more people uh, with the right skills um, in our industry. A lot, every industry says I need more people, but <laughs> we're certainly one of those. Oh, and this um, issue around um, supply chain is um, is really key. So we're not the only people. <laughs> That are coming out with a bold and ambitious plan for large amounts of offshore HVDC network, wind turbines, dot, 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 dot. A lot of countries are doing that in Europe, in the US, in uh, Japan, in um, China in particular. So, you know, we are, as always, part of a global supply chain for people, for um, metal, cable, wind turbines, ships, and everything else that goes with it. Uh, and then it even comes down to We've got the boats that you need to lay the cable to move the wind turbines. You know, these are uh, very large. You know, an, an offshore wind turbine, I think, sort of one blade is a sort of football pitch in length of 100 metres. Is sort of my 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 go-to figure. So, uh, does it take a long time? Yes. <laughs> are there some things in place to try and speed that up? Yes. But there's a lot to Constantina in that process um, and requires a lot of people to sort of realign yeah might it therefore given the planning is the probably the riskiest area uh, might it therefore be easier to put um offshore grids in place than onshore and or even the onshore undergrounded groups rather than pilots uh so i mean i think that that's a very live debate uh, certainly in parts of the country um there are a number of challenges so hvdc offshore is more expensive per moving per megawatt um onshore it's more expensive to underground it so it's it is more expensive um the marine environment is not free uh there are a limited number of spaces you can get cables down the east coast and in particular you still have to interface back to the transmission system onshore at some point because although you can put the cables in the sea you don't need the power in the sea you still need to bring it onshore somewhere and that needs to be at a sort of diverse range of locations we can't just land all of it into one hypothetical horrible brownfield site somewhere because that doesn't work from a power system point of view so so there are challenges for putting it in the sea the challenge i think with undergrounding is that it's actually really environmentally damaging whilst you do it it might in the long run you've lost your visual impact of pile towers and and wires um it makes fault finding harder if it's underground uh, you need to keep coming back up every so often to have a substation to deal with the the losses and things um and you're going to cut vast swathes through the countryside to to do that and i think that's a that's a trade-off that, that people will have to have. As of today, the national policy statement, the default is overhead lines is the standard, except in areas of outstanding natural beauty or a national park. So that's what that's sort of where we are today. But there are cases, as you will see from the, the diagram, where you just say, look, if I'm coming from the north of Scotland and I need to get to Kent, the two gigawatts is about the right amount, and then the sea is the right place to put it. Um, 
rather than well, well, the alternative to some of this would be another one or two routes onshore. I think that's the that's the challenge for GB GB PLC really is to you know I was talking to my, my boss about this yesterday that the 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 sale of the way in the 1950s and 60s that people were sold the super grid. Why 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 do we want this? Um, there are some lovely retro posters that haven't dated very well, but it, it enables you to have clean, relatively cheap, plentiful and secure energy in your home for the first time. This is a world where you could then have a washing machine and a refrigerator and an electric cooker and a three bar heater. So you didn't have to wash your clothes manually. You didn't have to heat your house with a coal fire. These were massive enablers of, of modern society. The world today is slightly different. We are entirely used to going to any plug, anywhere, anytime, plugging anything in, and it just working. When was the last time anyone in this room ever thought, I wonder if the light turns on today? We just don't. It just happens. And that's the challenge. And we're now saying, well, we've got to keep all of that good stuff. We need to do this massive change in the background about how we generate that energy, how we move it around. Um, as we move to that net zero future target. Okie dokie. Uh, so I am conscious of time and got lots of stuff that I could talk about. So what I'm going to do, I'll pick a few bits, not quite at random, but um, just to, to highlight the kind of complexity of some of, of this. So there are already lots of parties that we've we've touched on and, and, and have popped them 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 here and part of the challenge is that some of the governance and some of the structures are are split around all of these different different parties and other parties that are not here so central government in whitehall the department for energy uh, energy security and net zero uh, they set uk energy policy and energy policy is set by the uk government it's not devolved but the Scottish and Welsh governments do have a role in certain policy areas. They can set their own targets. They have some responsibilities for planning. They have responsibilities for, for other parts of their economies. Even though energy policy as a whole sits at the central government. We've spoken about Ofgem as the regulator, the actors in, in the absence of a customer in, the, in a monopolistic world, making sure that People are held to account for what they want to spend, uh, and that's delivering consumer value. We've spoken about ourselves uh, and our role in planning things today and in the future. Mentioned the TOs as the parties who actually then deliver things. There is a, a move to include, potentially include competition in future, and we have done some work around how we may integrate that into, into this. So competition and network or competition and network build is just not a presumption that a line, because it happens to be in, well, let's say if you built a line across out a new a new line out of Cowley heading south, something like that around here. At the moment, the default would be National Grid Electricity Transmission would build that because they are the geographic monopolistic TO for this area. Um, as long as that line is sufficiently sort of separable, um, then it doesn't have to be delivered by National Grid. It could be delivered by somebody else, it could be owned by somebody else for its lifetime. So that's one of the things that's looking at. The, 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 the reason that, that, that Ofgem and ourselves are looking at competition is competition, it, all things being equal in a sort of economic sense, should, should drive some pressure on cost. It should hold the TOs to account for, you know, I, I, I say it's going to cost 500 million and then somebody else comes along and says, well, I think it's 300 million. The TO might go, oh, Okay, we'll see. Um, so that's the concept. Competition helps keep prices down. The challenge, I guess, is that the expertise today about how to build this and maintain this stuff resides in the TOs. So are they actually the fastest and able to build things the quickest? Would co would competition slow things down? Is, it, is, it, is it, I guess, an open question. I, I don't have a, a view on that today. Um, that's that one. We've touched on the Crown Estate um, already certainly in England and Wales, um, the Crown Estate in, in Scotland uh, has a different relationship to government. It is closer to the Scottish government. The Crown Estate um, in England and Wales is, is more separate. 
And then there are various, and we just happen to pick two here, sort of trade bodies that get involved. Obviously, people are, are interested in, in what this happens. So let me have a look. Yes. Is there a role for sort of trading off the peaks by having things like battery storage, DSO level, things like that? Yeah, so we so in our so we plan, I find those that might help. So no, that's I keep clicking the wrong screen. So if I if I if I do this one very quickly and then that then I'll come to that point in a minute. So the way that we do network planning broadly is a sort of six stage process. So we use a range of future scenarios. So we use our best future energy scenarios. That then says, if this is where the generation and demand is going to be, uh, what does that then mean in terms of requirements? So how many megawatts do I need to get around the system at different times? We then say, well, here's all the pot of solutions that we could use to move the electricity around. We then assess those different solutions as to how good they are, as to when they're delivered, how much they cost, how much they move around. Um, and we assess those against different criteria, so both economic and environmental community and deliverability. That spits out, it sounds so easy when you say it like this, spits out a set of recommendations. That's like the Beyond 2030 report. And then the detailed design is that bit that the TOs then, then pick up on. So, in our future energy scenarios, we make assumptions about what we will get in terms of flexibility, demand reduction, and all of those kind of things from the distribution networks. So there is a there is a a, a sizable chunk of sort of that demand management at a small level in the distribution networks that is is baked into our future energy scenarios, um, and that needs to come into fruition in the next few years. And that's where somebody like Octopus is is driving that, but it's how do we make that more universal and into everybody? And and equally, we need to have good visibility of it and good assurance that it's going to do what it thinks it's going to do. Um, because again, going back to that, we were very you know, the power system of 20 years ago could be ran from a desk in our control room, and at any given time there were. 20 odd power stations, big power stations on the system, a few small ones here. You knew exactly what you needed to do to move anything around and exactly how it would respond. The power system now is, it, it is significantly more complicated in terms of there are a lot more individual smaller units on the system and how they all behave. But yeah, so there's a, there is a, a significant chunk of flexibility in the demand side that we assume. focus on heating electrification so demand centers from that and yeah. from industrial um, kind of growth but how much of a consideration in your planning goes into where those demand centers will be it, so, so a, a great great question so we we sort of know where domestic demand is because uh, it's uh, 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 i think i overheard a sort of half a conversation earlier about uh, margin uh, locational marginal pricing and what that might mean in the energy system um, uh, you know, nobody today decides to live in one part of the UK or the other on the basis of their Tenuos tariff, maybe except me, I don't know. <laughs> I'm in the East Midlands, which is slightly cheaper than the West Midlands. Uh, uh, but I used to set those tariffs in a previous life. So, um, sorry, rather glibly. So, so we make assumptions about um, domestic heat. One of the challenges across our future energy scenarios, which I think is a slide in a couple of I've gone the wrong way. There we go. Um, is the role on the difference of how we will decarbonize heat in future. So between our consumer transformation and our system transformation scenarios, the consumer transformation scenario assumes that the, the consumer sort of has to change how, how we interact with the system. So essentially we would have to sort of get rid of boilers and put in heat pumps. It's sort of the electrified solution. So here, primarily electricity directly does the heavy lifting of, of um, 
decarbonizing heat. The sort of opposite side of that is system transformation, where we sort of do it in the background for them. And today you might use natural gas, in the future you might use hydrogen. And therefore the system needs to produce hydrogen from surplus electricity, then have that moved to domestic property so it can be used in boilers. So those are sorts of different ones. When it comes to um, industrial demands, so larger scale demand, um, the modelling that sits behind the fares, um, different categories of industry are better inclined to decarbonise in different ways. So some will more naturally move towards electricity. Some such, I think, glass making doesn't work with electricity. You end up having to sort of go to hydrogen or, or something like that. We will then use things like the government's industrial strategy that talks about where it wants to locate future industrial clusters, hydrogen clusters, those types of things. The other thing that we've also done is that in, in, the, in the system transformation scenario, you need a lot of hydrogen electrolyzers to produce all that hydrogen that's then gonna be used for heat. Where you put those electrolyzers is important if you put them a long way away from the spare electricity you have to move all the electricity to them so we made some assumptions in here that actually a significant chunk of that goes into scotland there is then a corollary when we become niso we have to worry about maybe today i don't but as niso i've got to then get that hydrogen out of scotland and to the rest of the country so that that's how we sort of factory all of those things into that but paul i fear yeah. you have a lot more material no, no it's fine I, I, you from doing uh, so uh, come to a sort of yeah, yeah, yeah. So well, I'm, I'm, I think there were a couple of questions. So I'll yeah. just do those two, and then yeah, I'm, I'm just using these as prompts as we go. Yeah. Through. So I brought too much. I knew that was the best thing to do. Yeah, go on. Uh, yeah, so, so there's there's an old adage in the civil service, which is officials advise, ministers decide. So it's exactly the same. So we will produce our plan, do our analysis and hand that over to Secretary of State. Ultimately, is how we expect that process to work. So the Secretary of State will decide. Uh, I like that one. That was easy. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, Price signals and location of signals. Like, how large of an impact do you think that we have in the overall plan with the network? Because I assume, like, there's a lot of reinforcement that is being sent into account. It's a plan that yeah. maybe sort of not needed some location mechanisms are introduced. Yes. So, I think there are. So, I think it depends how you think that Rima is going to have an impact and whether you think it will change the location of primarily the offshore wind that's already in this plan. So the, the things in this plan um, are, there we go. So these wind farms are not, are not there because we put them there, they're there because they're, those are the ones that Crown Estate has leased. And importantly, the developers have paid a lot of money to have those leases. So I think this is the kind of this is this is the sort of question with Rima really, I think, is that do you think that's going to change? And and if you think it would change, so it might change in the long run, and there's a sort of medium term, I guess, here. In the medium term, if you said if these wind farms or wind are not going to connect here now because of locational pricing then we're not going to meet a 2030 target or a 2035 target. So I think it's a, which do you want to back? You know, this is, it takes, well, seven to 14 years to build a bit of transmission line. It takes up to a decade to get an offshore wind farm built. These things have a lead time. Um, if we want to get to those targets in 30 and 35, which are only six and 11 years away, um, then I suppose, we haven't really got time to sort of stop and come up with a plan B. However, is there lots of issues with having a single price across GB? Uh, and actually, is there a whole set of particularly storage that could benefit from seeing a location as well as temporal price? Absolutely. Because if, if you could see that it was really windy in Scotland, 
and that gave a signal to a battery storage in Scotland to charge. Then and, a, and a, a one in the south to go. Well, I'm, I'm the, the other side of a constraint. I'm, I'm actually got a better price. I'll output. Today it doesn't see that. It all gets smeared into one national price, um, and all of those constraints are dealt with by us outside of the market. So that's that's the sort of I can I entirely get it from a short run marginal point of view. It helps you with more efficient dispatch. It brings some of those constraint things out into the open. Although remember that that was explicitly a policy decision of a previous government within living memory to not do that. Oh, and then to charge things like busy OS that recovers the cost of constraints in this very flat way so that it's not distortive or not locational. And then again, to sort of steal your conversation from earlier, um, there's that there's that sort of open question of, well, why does somebody in London pay more for their electricity than somebody in Manchester than somebody in Scotland? I don't know. And how does that work with fuel poverty and other things like that? You know, there are examples. Other European countries have zonal pricing in the Nordic countries, but yeah. question from online. Oh, you can. Or should we just draw your presentation? Uh, yeah. Well, I think I think I'm I'm sort of pretty much there. I think as I've I've rambled my way through the last bits. Um. So, <laughs> I think oh, like this was my last slide. really. Um. So I, I sort of came here today to talk about beyond 2030. So, what we published in March uh, was a plan on top of the pathway to 2030 that gets us to around the sixth carbon budget by the middle of the next decade. So a power system that can operate zero carbon connects around 85 gigawatts of offshore wind off the coast of GB, but in doing so facilitates the need, uh, the building of a significant uh, new investment around 112 billion pounds worth of network offshore and onshore um, across GB. And now uh, the ball is sort of with our colleagues in the tra transmission owners to do the detailed network design and, and with Ofgem to work out how they're going to fund all of this. Okay, okay. thank you very much, <laughs> Paul. so that people online feel that they've engaged as well one of the questions is we're seeing more i think they describe it as natural hazards but more climate extremes oh yeah so is there anything about resilience in the networks we have to build in the exposure to overhead lines to hot temperature carrying a large current or uh, wind damage that kind of thing so that's an interesting question so Yes, and I think the majority of that actually sits at the moment at the detailed network design point of view. So, you know, what technologies that the the, the tiers actually deploy? What are the operating parameters of, of of things? You know, let's not build a substation at somewhere that might flood, um, in 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 the future, in the future yes. rather than just historically where it may not have flooded. Um, I think as as we evolve into our new role uh, of resilience, there is going to be this new relationship between. Uh, electricity, methane and hydrogen in what that means for essentially security of supply. So the, the, the today in the middle of winter, really high gas load. You want to maintain that gas load for, for two reasons. One is how most people heat their homes. And two, if you turn it off, it's really, really hard to turn it back on again. It takes days to turn back on towns if you have to turn them off for gas for safety reasons. Well, actually, if we fast forward 10, 15 years, gas isn't doing that heavy lifting any longer on the heating. It's it's electricity. And so how should the electricity system, how resilient sort of macroscopically does the electricity system need to be is a sort of interesting question as well. So there's both a, a detailed sort of asset by asset question, um, but also something in that sort of broader space of, well, what is acceptable for the electricity system of the future to go off? I think we're very used to now having an electricity system that is very resilient. The transmission system is remarkably resilient. Distribution networks are very resilient, certainly more resilient than they were when I was growing up. I don't know whether it's because I was just in rural Shropshire, but it just used to go off a lot. But there's still a lot of consumer reporting to tell that their network's down. It's when you see social messaging. Yeah. And, oh, network must be down. Yeah, I always flinch when it goes off at home. Like, oh, no, no, what's happened? <laughs> Oh, sorry, Nick. Sorry, you carry on. Just no, no, no. I've questions for a while, but uh, yeah, no, I, well, I, people need to go as well. We'll understand. But yes, yeah, this may be quite a cheeky question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. It seems quite likely now that we, in um, four weeks, three days' time, will be a Secretary of State who's 
stated IH's priority is to get a zero carbon electricity system by 2030, not by 2035. I assume that officials in Desnes are, as we speak, um, thinking about how they're going to respond and what they're going to advise. What, what, what if anything, what would you say to them? Uh, I'm going to uh, be back as I think the fifth at this point. Um, so uh, on the fifth, on the no, I, I get that. on the fifth, on the fifth of July, I'm very happy to have that conversation. I can I can hear my little Hannah from External Affairs going, "Don't talk about that. Don't talk about that." <laughs> at this point, so the good news is, was no problem for a supplier last week. Greg Jackson said, "Yeah, take that conversation." And I think this is this is the yeah. At the moment, we we are a regulated business. Uh, we're moving into state ownership. Um, we just need to make sure, you know, that's why today is very much about what we've already published. But it, a very interesting question. Would it help if Secretary of State was actually energy literate? Not, not talking about any individuals in <laughs> I'm just thinking, would it help or does it actually hinder that someone thinks they know what they're talking about in that space? <laughs> uh, I would like to think that our government is more than the Secretary of State. And I have advisors who know more. Indeed. Sorry. <laughs> no, you can keep asking me cheeky questions. I'll keep declining to answer them. <laughs> yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so a great question, and I think there's a there's a handful of reasons for that. So, historically, the way that networks were planned and regulated was all about what needs to be built now and next. It was a pretty steady state world. You didn't have to have big changes. So the whole planning process is what comes now and next. So we are evolving away from that. Um, our future energy scenarios have always looked at longer, so to say to 2050, and we include all of that data into our modelling. So when we're making a decision about something, we look at its impact into the 30s, 40s and 50s, uh, 20, 30s and 40s, sorry. Um, but we are conscious that, and CSNP will do this, will actually say, actually, what does the network of 2050 look like? And then work backwards. But that actually involves turning our whole sort of approach on its head, because historically we've gone today and forwards where we're trying to get to in the future is end and backwards. So good question though. I think this gentleman was. Um, coming back to the resilience and the kind of weather dependency that you mentioned 40 to 60 percent mm -hmm. of the generation. So how do you currently envisage the, uh, the backup systems? In yeah. The so I think it's a uh, so there's a, there's a number of things that we foresee is that you you need. So you need a diversity in your energy mix. So you'll need carbon capture and storage, potentially with biomass, carbon capture and storage potentially with natural gas. So you're it's it's not producing um, emissions, but it can be used to provide electricity. You'll need storage, but not just battery storage. You'll need long duration storage, something that can move it from this week to next week or this month to next month or even last season to this season. Um, in a way the gas network does today. Um, and uh, interconnection. So it's the combination of kind of all of these things together um, that is designed to sort of ride you through those periods of, of lower renewable output. So you, you've got, a, and you have probably, you know, in, in the future, we may have 100 to 120 gigawatts of offshore wind. That's more than we would, would need. But the idea being that even on a not very windy day, you're still going to get 10 gigawatts of wind um, yeah, combined with storage, other technologies and interconnection. But it is it is something we worry about. You know, how do you keep the system secure? When a big chunk of your thing is is intermittent and then thinking about things like uh, dunk or flout, these long prolonged periods of still weather. So. Okay. Uh, yeah. How far along the 14 year timeline? Oh planning to building or the lines that are shown in the picture. It's, it's, has the 40 year window started with the published map? OK, yeah, good good question. So uh, they vary um, because some things have been around in, in iterations for a number of years. Most of the big lines on here will, will probably be delivered in the mid 2030s. So you're one or two years into the start of the process. 
Okay, so there's hope that they'll be there by 2035. Uh, with a fair wind, yes. <laughs> That is a very good question. Um, so uh, no, today our plan is this is the plan that we need. When we're doing the work to support the regulatory approval process, that will include different options and the cost of it not happening. So we do do that sort of counterfactual analysis of if this didn't happen or if it was late, what would that cost? And often if something is is late, you can run into costs of hundreds of millions of pounds a year to consumers. So actually there is a strong benefit to, to building all of these lines, even though they're really expensive. You know, each of these things is, is hundreds of millions or billions of pounds each. The cost of not doing it and not having that capacity is actually higher, even in the short run. So that's generally the way we, we don't we don't have a smorgasbord of plans say oh here's the this one didn't work this one didn't work we plan the network holistically um, and then provide evidence to Ofgem that's the people who hold the purse strings to say yeah, this this will be the sort of consequence of not doing this and as you can see you know that thing I spoke about earlier around you've got power in the north it then comes further south it lands in Lincolnshire you've then got a you don't you don't need it in Lincolnshire unless you're going to build a lot of industry in Lincolnshire you then got to move it further south again, so you need a new line from Lincolnshire you need to reinforce the lines, and so on, and so on, and so on. So everything we plan the network holistically because of that very fact that you need to get a megawatt from here to here, not just from here to here. It's sort of the way through. Yeah. Just coming back, connected. Um, have you kind of prioritised different elements of this in terms of what bang you get for your buck? Um, it's a huge amount of money that a future government and the public will have to spend. There could realistically be resistance at some stage in the future. So you're spending that amount of money. Do you know which are the, the key elements you want to get done first? Like, uh, we have so not that, that, done that, 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 Yeah. All yeah, and I, I think that, that's probably why the, my, normally my answer to that is, well, it, you need it all. Uh, and actually, if you gave me free reign, then probably more than's already on there. Because this this is this is not a system that is constraint free. This is not a system that doesn't have bottlenecks or congestion. Um, it's a sort of balance between here's what we think can be delivered. Um, yeah, I'm going to go with all of it, please. Sh shoot for the stars. If you miss, you might get the moon thrown in. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There could it be a good place for developers to build that would be highly affordable and be near? OK, so yeah, so the at the moment, as I sort of alluded to earlier, the decision about where generation wants to go is not, not us. It's, it's the market with a bit of government tweaking here and there. Um, the concept, at least of the spatial strategic, strategic spatial energy plan, is that you have some decisions uh, some optimization about locations that makes a trade off between network, location, land, and so on. And that that then has some status in where things can get consented or planning. So, in, in a bit like the way that today you can't get consent for a wind farm in England, if the SCP says you only need 10 gigawatts of wind, more wind in Scotland, that's all you would be able to consent. So that is the aim of the SSCP. That's what was in Nick Windsor's report. That's what the sort of step is, because if you've got more certainty about where things are going to locate, you can have more certainty about the network that you need. If you've got more certainty, you can get on with it. Whereas today you go, well, there's 600 gigawatts of stuff that wants to connect in the queue. We don't need anywhere near that. We need maybe 180 or something. I forget the number off the top of my head. But which 180 of that is actually going to make it from there to there is quite hard to work out. They almost need a role for leasing the queue, such as the yeah. distribution well, uh, network yes. operators are already doing. This is never going to get consented. And, and, and that's, and that's yeah, if the SSCP comes along and says, well, we don't need 300, I'm making numbers up, we don't need 300 gigawatts of batteries, we need 100 gigawatts of batteries or 80 gigawatts of batteries, and we need 
20 of them in Scotland, 20 of them here, 20 here. You're already over that. You, you can join the queue, but you're at the very back sort of thing. Yeah, so, so the aim is that would include uh, as there's an economic element, but then an environmental community. Um, yeah, deliverability. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to suggest we take an advert for next week and thank for all the ones for. I keep it on first. Well, you can take the <laughs> questions yeah, yeah, yeah. personally then as well. Yeah, yeah. So thanks again. Thank for you. Very, very interesting. So the people who held out to the bitter end online as well, next week, final week of the term of the year, in fact, and if they can decide between the two of them, Ted Moser and or Catherine Sugar will be talking about the Bristol City Leap project, which is looking mm. at new financing and procurement models, but we don't know if either of them can make it in person. So watch this space, but thanks very much indeed. Have a good evening, and please, if you will take some questions no, as well. <laughs>